So, welcome to week seven. Uh, this is part seven of our uh, exploration into mechanics and materials um, and engineering basic seminars. Um, this week, we will be continuing to work on stress and strain, um, but hopefully this will actually be our last, uh, our last day on that topic, at least on introductory stress and strain. And we'll cover... Uh, we'll finally get to our conclusion of this kind of four-part series, talking about the isotropic linear elastic model. Um, so I know the last couple of days I've been reviewing stress and strain, but there's a lot to cover here, so I'm just going to jump right into it. So, um, what is the linear li uh, what is the isotropic linear elastic model besides just a big mouthful? So this is a model that describes a stress-strain relationship using um, a couple a, a big set of assumptions that simplifies a problem for us um, but still provides a good model that we can use in design um, the the two big theories that we're using here just to review are constitutive theory and the balance law so constitutive theory is when we've been talking about this um, stress equals E times strain. This is saying, hey, uh, yeah. Are you streaming on YouTube right now? Oh right, ha ha ha! You guys probably need, you probably need this screen. <laughs> I was wondering about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, give me a sec. Uh, let's see. You want a windowed projector, and you probably need to actually see it. Share screen. You want this one. There you go. Now can you guys see it? Yeah. Or, yeah. <laughs> All right. Cool. Um. So yeah. Uh. So we're this week we're talking about um we're talking about the this theory as a whole. Um. This this theory is made up of kind of uh some more simplified assumptions from physics. Um. First part is the constitutive theory. So we're saying things, real stuff, is made up of, um, is made up as if it were a spring. Um, we model it about like Hooke's law, and we say that all of this material is going to stress according to um, how much it strains. So remember, if we if we were to to make this look like Hooke's law here. Um, if we were to, to make the analogy with Hooke's law, we would say F equals KX. And if we divide all these things by air, if we sort of normalize these by area, um, then it turns, it looks like our stress strain relationship here. Um, the other big assumption that we make is that our material is hom homogeneous or homogeneous. Um, what that means is basically it's all made up of the same stuff. Um, or if it's made up of different things, we treat them differently. So we're saying that in this block of iron, we don't really care that there's some that there's different crystals in different places that technically do slightly different things. We're just saying this whole thing, all of this here is iron, is Fe, and we're saying it all behaves like in one way in the way that iron does um and then if we have something that's made up of two different materials so if we have iron here and we'll say copper here um, then we actually have to analyze those two things separately so we have one set of equations and constants for iron and one set of equations and constants for copper um, this is this is where this idea of the material being isotropic comes from. So tropic, um, whenever you hear this ending, tropic is topic talking about how the material reacts reacts to stimulus. So um, we are assuming that everything reacts to stimulus in the same way. Iso is um, Another way of saying that they're the same. Um, so 
for example, if we take if we take a a block of iron, let's say uh, we've got a we've got a cube here. I can turn this cube on any of the faces. I can rotate it. I can rotate it in any direction, and I would expect it to react in the same way. Um, where you can't use this model or um, some some material where this wouldn't make sense would be something like carbon fiber. So if you have if you have a carbon fiber panel, right, um, you can pull it and stretch it in these directions. You can you can try and deform it along the um, along the directions that the fibers are in. But if you try and deform it in plane, so if we look at this as a really thin sheet, it deforms really easily in another direction and it'll actually fracture really quickly in that other direction so something like a carbon fiber plate or even like a piece of spaghetti um, a piece of spaghetti if you pull it in one direction it, it'll react a lot differently than if you push it um, spaghetti is actually something that's much stronger in tension than in compression um, so we we approximate iron as being something that reacts equally in every single direction um, and for this reason we can't use something like the this isotropic model for uh, for carbon fiber there are other models that we use for carbon fiber um, and we might get into those later but that's actually not even something that you get into um, in your regular design classes um, that'd be something like uh, something like 401, uh, where you're really talking about more advanced non-linear designs um, or non-isotropic materials, um, where you start to do analysis with those. So that's the first part, isotropic. The second part, linear. So what does it mean for a material to be linear? Um, I'm sure by now you've at least heard of a stress-strain curve. So this is an example of a stress-strain curve. What this does is you're, you're literally just plotting the amount of strain versus the amount of stress. Um, this equation here, this equation here describes the region on this stress strain curve that acts in a straight line. Now this, if we do rise over run, right, this should be E over one. So this is strain. Remember strain is epsilon stress we have sigma so if i were to write the equation for this line or the the equation that predicts my my material um how my material reacts you would get sigma equals e epsilon um uh, a graph like this is something that's determined empirically so whenever you hear us talking about in, doing an instron test or um, doing a bend test, what what we're doing is we strain the material a little bit. Um, we strain the material. We either apply a known force to cause a known stress, because remember we we typically think that we know what the what the cross section or what our if if we have a test piece, say we say we use a, a regular ANSI test piece, kind of looks like like a, a two sided shovel like that. We know the dimensions here. So we know the area. If we apply a force, we know what our applied force is, then we know the stress. Um, and then we can just measure the strain with something aptly called the strain gauge, or basically just a really, really sensitive ruler. Um, so you're just measuring directly the change in length, so the delta. Um, so this this curve this graph here shows kind of how um how we expect isotropic materials to deform um for something like steel or even plastics you typically get this you get this region that we describe as the um the linear region this is the region that we design things for um that you typically design things for, because in this region we expect the material to bounce back. So this is this is also known as the elastic region. Um, this would be everything up to 
I guess uh, technically it should be everything up to the yield point. So up to the point where it yields. So in this elastic region, um, just over time through the last hundred or so years that people have been um, really applying this model, doing engineering with it, we, we see that materials will tend to return to their original shape if you only bend them up to a certain point. And this, this would be like a paper clip, right? If you bend a paper clip, let's see if I can draw a paper clip. Uh, it's kind of a paper clip. I guess it needs another, another loop around, right? If you bend a paper clip, if you bend this out just a little tiny bit, right, you'd expect it to spring back. No big deal. Or if you put some paper in there, you'd expect it to spring back to its original shape. But if you if you bend this leg all the way out here, you wouldn't expect it to return to its original shape. Well, we now say that it, the material has yielded, or it is it's become permanently deformed. Um, so this this point that we define as yield stress is sort of the point on this graph where. Um, if we deform it anymore, if we have any more strain, then the stress is no longer linear. Um, we start to see a different stress, and that means when it returns to sort of a, when it returns to an unstressed state, it'll return to some place like here. So it'll return all it'll return with some permanent deformation. This would be a permanent deformation here. Um, so that's what the that's what the yield stress is. So in our isotropic linear elastic model, we're saying the the material behaves elastically, behaves like a spring. It behaves in the same in every direction. Um, we're, we're assuming it's something like iron or a metal or a plastic. We're assuming it behaves linearly, so it follows this equation. We can predict it. And we're also assuming that it returns to its original shape. Um, when we choose the material that we want to design something out of, we choose it for its, well, oftentimes we choose it for its yield strength, or we, we choose it so that the stress that we predict it will see is only... Um, is below this point of yield stress. And usually we we'll wanna keep it a good distance below. We wanna have a good, a good factor of safety to make sure that we, we don't permanently deform the material. Um, a couple of other interesting points on here are the ultimate strength and the, the fracture strength. So ultimate strength would be, um, ultimate strength is essentially saying the highest something can, the highest we can stress something before we see um, before we see a rapid decrease in uh, a rapid decrease in strength. So um, usually, uh, so this this diagram here is actually pretty um, it's uh, pretty exaggerated. Oftentimes, the ultimate strength and the fracture stress are really really close together. So. The ultimate strength is the highest measurable stress that we can put on something before it starts to give way. Um, and a lot of times, this uh, this part of the graph, this is where, if you remember a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about necking, where rather than actually stretching the material out, you start to reduce the area. The material starts to pull in, which is why you see, in theory, a reduction in stress. Um, your your material starts to give way, um, and your uh, you see that necking that that material failure basically starts to set in. And then fracture stress is exactly what it sounds like. It's where your your two pieces actually sever; they separate. Um, so you you physically separate the two the two sections from each other. Um, but we usually, in engineering, we try and stay out of this region, or we at least try and stay far enough away from this region that if we ever get here, um, something else more important has been triggered. So some alarm, some other something weaker that we intentionally wanted to fail first, um, or something of that nature. Uh, there is there is a type of engineering.
Oh, man. I couldn't think of it last week. I had it on the tip of my tongue, and I forgot to write it down. Um, but there is a type of engineering. It's it's kind of a research level. Um, a lot of like PhD candidates right now are talking about it, where you actually design in this nonlinear region. So you, you design for compliant materials. That's what it is. Uh, compliant design. Things things that you expect to deform, um, you design for them to deform beyond their, uh, beyond their linear elastic region. So we've covered what makes it isotropic, everything moves in the same direction, what makes it linear, and we're in this region of the graph, it's elastic because it follows Hooke's law, and we expect it to stay following Hooke's law, so we never leave the linear region. And then model is because it is a model, right? We are making a, a whole bunch of assumptions here. Um, we are not calculating what the physical reactions should be, how the electrostatic and the the magnetic, the electromechanic, or sorry, the electromagnetic forces between all the particles in here. Um, we're not calculating individually for each of those what's happening. This is a model. We're trying to describe, in general, the macroscopic behavior. Um, so some of the assumptions that we make with this model are that boundary conditions are in insignificant. So um, a lot of times when you see uh, a problem like this, if we're, if we're talking about, oh, let's just say we had that... Um, that axial problem that we did last time. Um, if we were to analyze the stress for this, we would never talk about the stress um, kind of within within a a small bubble around the uh, around the boundaries. The reason here is the, your loading conditions around this boundary. If I were to to zoom in, are start to become different, right? You have little moments that start to be applied here. Um, while all of these springs are kind of, if you if you imagine all of these, uh, all the molecules in here as being connected by springs, right? All the springs out here will, you could generally expect them to behave the same way. But once you start to get closer and closer to the wall here, um, if we assume this is truly rigid, then it's like we cut the springs here in half. Um, so we're assuming that when we use this model, we're talking about stuff that is away from boundaries. Um, to that end, we usually are also talking about areas that are away from stress concentrations. So whenever you have a sharp bend in material or a um, uh, some really, really small, really fine detail, um, we introduce stress concentrations. Um, if you think about it, these are areas where the, um, or these are sections where the, the cross-sectional area would change super dramatically. Um, however, your forces applied over them stay about the same. Uh, but we wouldn't say, we wouldn't say like if, if we were to zoom in, if we were to say this thing here, let's say there's some, some little manufacturing defect. We've got, I don't know, some, some little section where the, the tool path was off, right? If we blow that up, we blow that up to be down here. We wouldn't expect this part to be all of a sudden super, uh, a whole lot stronger in this little section where we see some some little spike on there, right? And if you if you put a force on here, you can even you might even be able to break it off with your finger. Um, so when when we talk about the linear elastic model, we're talking in a macroscopic way over regions that are separated from high stress concentrations and separated from boundaries. Um, to that end, that's uh, a a big um, a big caveat here is a lot of times we like to draw our free body diagrams, or we like to make our cut free body diagrams right on these borders or right on these boundaries. And we, like, if I were to assume it was right at this junction here, we do that for a convenience sake. Um, we do that for our, um, for our design goals. However, 
um, we understand that when we when we make this cut here, we're assuming that the the changes, the little stress concentrations at the end here, aren't big enough to impact our design as a whole. So um, that's that's what we're really talking about with insignificant boundary conditions. The second thing that we assume is that we have small displacements. Um, the reason for that is we want to stay within this elastic region. The larger your strain is, so once you strain past this point here, once we strain past there, then the behavior is no longer elastic. So we want to make sure that whenever we're using this model to predict our behavior, the displacements that we're predicting are always within this region. Um, this is something that will come up a lot if you're using if you're doing FEA for example if your FEA tells you that some portion of your material is deflecting i don't know a foot and a half right let's say let's say we have something that's an inch long and uh and we we messed up some portion of our FEA and it says it's deflecting by a foot well we expect that to be a poor result um we we say that that's not indicative of real behavior even though when you run fea it typically um you typically don't have necessarily errors as you would think of them like you, your fea might return mathematically correct statements but it um even though they're mathematically correct according to our model they're not something that we would expect to see in real life so we always expect to see small displacements here. Um, a lot of times the question comes up, what defines a displacement as small? Um, and that always, of course, depends on the material. If your material is, if your material strains after 0.001%, right? If your, if your yield point is at 0.001%, then you would have to um, small displacements would have to be anything smaller than that. If you have a material that that enters this nonlinear region at a 2% strain, well, then a small displacement would be anything smaller than that 2% strain. Um, the next thing that we, the next assumption that we make is we don't see any buckling or exotic failures. By exotic, I just mean more complicated. Um, so buckling, we'll, we'll talk about buckling later on, um, actually probably in a, a couple of weeks, um, but bump, buckling is essentially a phenomenon where if you, if you have something really tall and really skinny, um, and you're putting, you're putting a force on it, like straight down, um, because this system is kind of unstable, as soon as you're slightly off, even if even if this is a really small angle, even if this is like, uh, you, let's say this would be like 89.5 degrees, right? Even if you're a really small angle off, because um, because you now have some moment arm here, um, you would kind of expect this to snap in half. You'd expect it to to kind of deflect like that. Um, so we're assuming that that's not happening. We're assuming that um, all of the uh, all the situations that we're going to analyze with this model are either far enough away from uh, the the dimensions are different enough that we don't expect to see this, or the forces are low enough that we wouldn't expect that to happen. And then there's other exotic failures too. Um, a fun one that we like to talk about this year was torsional buckling. Um, which is similar, but crazy cool. Um, involves a lot of math that most people had no idea existed until they tried it. Um, there's also there's also um, like layer shearing. Um, there's grain. Uh, there's grain failures. There's um, there's uh, uh, fatigue failures. We're assuming none of those none of those failures are going to be present so we're we're just simply saying how is this going to displace itself and then return if we remove the, the force that we're putting on it um the last thing and this is uh this is one of the 
one of the rules that we actually sometimes break when we're using this model is that we assume tension and compression act identically on our um, on whatever our material is. So let me go ahead and make a new a new page here. Um, something like concrete. Um, concrete is actually much much stronger in compression. It's much stronger in compression than it is in tension. Right, you can drive a car over a concrete bridge, but if you were to try to if you were to try to hang something under that bridge, um, yeah, may, and maybe that's not a maybe that's not a good example. But um, right in a building, you see big concrete columns, you see big pillars made of concrete. You don't see long extended sections. Your your long extended sections are going to be steel or maybe concrete reinforced with steel. Um, for something like this, uh, if we were to draw a full stress strain curve, we would actually have to draw it um, rather than just in the positive. We'd have to draw positive and negative axes. So let me try and make that a straight line. Let's see, these are axes. And this is our curve, right? We would expect it to behave with some slope in the positive direction. So this would be if it's acting in tension, acting in tension. And then maybe we see a very different slope. We see a very different slope acting in compression. So for concrete, this would be much, much steeper, almost vertical acting in compression. Compression. Um, typically, the way you get away with this um, is you, you basically treat it as two different materials. You say, oh, I'm talking about concrete in tension, and we'll use this value for displacements that are in tension. Um, and then if you're if you see it s things happening in compression, you would treat it as something different. You'd say, "Oh, this is concrete acting in compression." Um, sometimes it doesn't matter. Um, so for something like a like a, just a, a flat road that's on the dirt um, that you like, you just paved a, an asphalt road. Um, sometimes you can assume that tension and compression are going to be e equal. Um, but again, that's an assumption that we're making. Uh, even though we know the material doesn't quite behave that way for the design, for the situation that we're analyzing, um, we can apply that model. We can assume it works. Um, I know especially early on uh, as engineers, we're used to the world of physics, um, maybe from high school, we're used to physics and math and math where everything's very precise, right? You have, um, right, you have y equals mx plus b, and y will always, always, always equal mx plus b. In the real world, with real materials, and uh, we, have, we have all sorts of unpredictable things, uh, or we have all sorts of little, little behaviors that we maybe could predict, but it wouldn't be worth our time to predict. So in in engineering, we often use something like y approximately equals mx plus b. And we judge whether that is of whether that approximation is valid based on our given assumptions. Um, so for the for the linear isotropic model here, or the, the isotropic linear elastic model, we are assuming that um, all of these things are valid assumptions, um, and then we get predictable results using these. So, what are those predictable results? This is where we start to introduce the idea of the stress tensor. So, um, before we were we've been talking about stress in one dimension. We've been talking about a stress equals a force over some area. And we've, we've been saying, oh yeah, it, you, you have some surface area and you pull on it or you push on it, right? That's, that's stress. Well, we live, as we've kind of been alluding to, we live in a three-dimensional world. So 
we can see stress in lots of different ways. Um, on some, some given little block of material. So let's say I have, um, I have this circular thing. I'm assuming it's, it's kind of held onto a wall here or bracketed on, it's rigidly fixed. Um, I want to take just some little, some little cuboid some just little tiny piece of material in here. Often we call this a differential piece of material. Just something, something that's so small that it can't, um, that it can't be divided from its neighbors in, anymore in a meaningful way. Um, this isn't to be confused with a molecule. So this isn't, this isn't like we have a molecule, like an iron molecule. That behaves this way and it's not even saying we have some crystal lattice pattern it's not even saying that we have some crystal structure of iron right um, we aren't we aren't chemists although we care about the um, although we care about this crystalline pattern although we care about those smaller structures to sort of uh, inform our predictions the math that we're doing applies a little bit larger than this scale. So think of the dimensions of this cube as just slightly smaller, just slightly smaller. We'll call this differential, this differential distance D. It's just ever so slightly smaller than the smallest thing we can actually measure. So if I, I break out my, I don't know, um, I break out my micro vu my micro vu um, optical comparator and i i zoom my microscope in super far and even on that optical comparator right i only have lines that are this big and we're saying it's it's a little smaller than we can actually measure so it's fundamentally the smallest block of material that we can think about um and we want to talk about how that material behaves in each of the cardinal directions. Um, so the subscripts you see on here have to do with the direction that we're applying to. Um, so some of these are normal stresses and some of these are shear stresses. If you remember back a couple weeks ago, um, shear stress, um, I believe we called shear stress tau. Um, tau is often the is often the variable that is associated with shear stress however um, if you're talking about stress in general we usually use sigma so if you're talking about stress in all three dimensions we use sigma we also use sigma for normal stresses for normal stresses um, but you'll you'll see in a second here so either yeah on the on the next slide kind of how those um, how those break up. But let's talk about what these actually mean. So um, on this picture here, I'm going to put some some axes, some dimensions. Or, well, not dimensions. I'm, I'm going to put a coordinate system on here. Um, we'll say this is one direction, this is a second direction, and this is a third direction. Um, and rather than labeling this X, Y, and Z, I'm going to label it 1, 2, and 3. The numbers, the numbers are meaningless. They're just labels for my directions. So I'm going to call this direction 2. I'll call this direction 3. I'll call this direction 1. Um, just so it kind of lines up with our picture here. So if I were to pull that little differential cube out of our material, it would look like this. Um, when you see uh, when you see each of these surfaces, we think about these stresses as some cut area. So this is our this is our cut area. I'll, I'll use a different color for that so you can kind of see. This is our cut area, and then there's some other other direction we're talking about. So we, when we make a cut, when we when we're trying to analyze the stress at some location we first need to make a cut at that location to figure out um, what is going on same way that we've been doing 
um, we calculate the area, we divide it by the force applied over the total area, and we would say every, every little cube, and say every little differential cube in this circle sees the same normal force over that area. Um, so a normal force is a force that's in the direction of your cut. Um, remember, a normal force is something that's acting perpendicular to the plane that you're looking in, or normal, right? Perpendicular, normal, orthogonal, they all mean the same thing. So this would be, this would be a stress acting in direction two, in direction two, on a plane that was cut in direction two. So all the stresses that we're talking about on this plane, um, all the stresses that we're, we're trying to figure out in this direction have a two in the first position because it's on, it's cut perpendicular to direction two. And then the other direction is whatever, uh, whatever or the other number on this subscript is whatever direction that stress is pointing in. So for a normal stress, these will be the same number. This is, we made our cut, we made our, our cut for analysis in a, in plane two, or if I were to put letters on here, maybe this would be the X plane. Um, and then I'm talking about the normal force or the, which I'm talking about a normal force in this plane, which would be a normal force in direction two. So this shear to two, or sorry, not shear, stress to two is stress acting in, in direction two when we an analyzed it in the scope of plane two. For a shear stress, it's the same idea. If we had, uh, if we think back to that seatbelt example with the, with the two tabs, Right, I'll, I'll go ahead and add a page here. We think back to our seatbelt example, right? We had, a, we had a bolt here, we had a bolt, we cut it, we cut it here, because um, we said this is, this is where the, um, where the seatbelt is sort of pulling on it, right? Maybe we have a tab there, um, we have a tab there and a tab there. So we are analyzing it in this plane. This is the, the plane where we cut our body to figure out what's going on. Now, if we look in that plane, we said there was a force going this direction, a shear force. If I were to, to draw this kind of um, iso uh, yeah, isotropically here, or sorry, isometrically. Um, oh boy, that is about the grossest bolt I think I've ever drawn. <laughs> we'll make it, try and make it look less like a mushroom. There, pretend that's a, that's a bolt. Maybe we've got some, uh, I don't know, whatever. That's a bolt. <laughs> this is, this is our, our cut plane that we're analyzing, and our force is going in this direction now. So we said the shear stress, we said the shear stress tau is still equal to the force divided by the area, but it's just a force acting in a different direction in this plane. So if this is direction x, let's say this is direction y, and this is direction Z, we would say that our shear, this is shear in the X plane, because we made an X plane cut, is now acting in the Y direction, because the force that we see is in the Y direction. We would say that equals Fy over the total area. Um, and the reason that we, we can, for each of these little differential elements, you know, we have all these little, all these little squares, all the little cubes in there. The reason that we can still use this model for all those differential elements is they all take up some little teeny tiny area 
but when we add them together, they make up the whole area that the whole force is distributed over. We would, we would think of this uh, essentially as saying, okay, each of these teeny tiny, each of these little differential cubes, each of these little tiny pieces of material have a little teeny, teeny, tiny force that they're resisting. And they have a really, really teeny, tiny area. An area so small, we can't even describe it. But when we sum them all up, if we take the average over the whole surface, this is that where that calculation comes from. This is, um, this is a good model to describe the stress and the strain that we see um, that we see in all of those little cubes. So we say um, we say tau x y equals f y over a. This is the same thing as sigma x y. It's just I've used the letter tau here to indicate that it's in shear. It's in shear, and I've used the letter sigma to indicate that we're talking about a stress. Um, if we move on to here, uh, one thing you'll notice, uh, so I guess, uh, let me, let me backtrack just a little bit. So we talked about those in one direction. If you're doing this for a really complicated problem, let's say, let's say this bolt, um, I'll, I'll go back to the bolt side. Let's say not only does this bolt experience shear, but we also have it preloaded. So we have a nut on here that's putting the bolt in tension. Well, now we need some way of describing, we need some way of stating how, do th how that bolt reacts in other surfaces. Um, and maybe, I don't know, maybe we hang, uh, maybe, we, maybe we packed some, um, we packed some little nylon bushing in there. So it's, it's squeezing the bolt in this hole, right? For some for some little thing here, well now you've got now you've got in this in this one little area, if I were to, to sort of pull that little piece of material out, you now have a lot more going on. You have a compression in this direction, you have a tension in that direction, and you have a shear in this direction. A shear in this direction. Um, and this shear is acting just in this plane. Um, if we have a shear, right, the, the big difference, if you remember back a couple weeks, the big difference between a shear force and a normal force is this is acting unsupported. So there's not, there isn't something else that's, like, there's no, there's no fixture here. There's no glue holding this bolt that's counteracting the um it's counteracting the seat belt pulling on it it's just trying to pull it, it's like unsupported it's just trying to pull this material apart what's different between this shear acting on this face and the compression acting here say acting acting in the middle here is now there's something there's something there's a reaction to it there's um, we see we see a support on one side and an applied force on the other. Um, and I know that can be confusing, um, and I'm kind of going through it quickly, but hopefully, hopefully you can start to get an idea of what that looks like, of the the difference there, of why even though we have even though we have three cardinal directions, why we have nine different types of uh, different types of stress that we want to talk about. Um, and in reality, it's a little bit simpler than that. So there's actually only six different types of stress. So if we, if we, I just want to real quick group these together. So I'm just going to put some circles around these and pretend it's arbitrary for now, but I'll explain in a second why it makes more sense. Um, so this stress tensor, the reason it's called a tensor, tensor is another name for a matrix. Um, this is just the, um, the way that we like to represent. The, it's, it's a good way of collecting all of our numbers, right? Rather than just saying, okay, 
stress x x is this stress x y is that stress x z is that rather than giving a list we just present it in in a, a little nicer format in this tensor um, and that also makes it easier if we want to do mathematical operations on it it makes it a little bit easier to work with um, you'll notice here that one one right i could think of this as x as sigma xx one two could be sigma xy and then down here i could say it's sigma yx um you see the the that first number and and the the position that we put it in this in this tensor in this matrix is just uh it, it just follows the indices so we just say we go xyz or one two three um and this is this is how you would read out indices in a tensor right this is index one one index one two uh, you usually say row first and then column so row one position one this one would be row number two position number three or column number three um so this is this stress tensor is just a good way of collecting all of these together so now why did i circle so, oh. so we have a question yeah go ahead so um i never i never realized this in class but uh so in, uh, like the one three 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 those are stresses those are like normal stresses and then the ones that are shear, shear stresses uh, you're kind of breaking up, but I'm pretty sure I got your question. So yes, um, so these, that's right where I'm getting to. Um, perfect segue. So oh. everything along our diagonal, our, our stresses that are in the same direction as the plane that, that they were cut on, those are all normal stresses. So one, one, two, two, three, three. Those are all normal stresses or stresses that we would typically call sigma just in whatever direction then our shear stresses are all of these other ones that are acting in the planes um so sigma two three is a stress that's acting in cut plane two direction three but we like to we like to call it uh we like to call it tau two three usually just to reinforce the fact that it is indeed a shear stress and it's not actually a normal stress. Um, but these are equivalent statements. So if, I, if someone asks you for sigma 2, 3 or tau 2, 3, they're the same thing. In, in literature, um, in textbooks, you'll often see them interchanged, but it really just depends on the situation that you're talking about, right? If you're talking about a stress tensor, Sometimes it makes more sense to just call it sigma one one, sigma one two, sigma one three, since you only really like we just want to call this sigma. We just call the whole thing the sigma tensor. Um, if you are talking about different components of that, like if someone asks you, "Oh, what's the shear stress?" then maybe it's more appropriate to call it tau. So in this, uh, in our stress tensor normal stresses are going to be the ones the ones on that diagonal and then the shear stresses are the ones that i've circled in blue here so sigma 3 1 equals tau 3 1. so uh, another big thing to note is this this little differential cube right this little section of material still needs to follow all of the same laws as our larger piece right imagine imagine we did a bunch of cut free body diagrams just in all three dimensions so we had you know we had our initial bolt and we just cut it one two three with three different planes or i guess technically six different planes because you'd have to kind of cut around it to get the shape but we're still this is still this little piece of material still follows all the rules that we saw before so you still have to follow statics you still have to say the sum of the forces is the same the sum of the moments is the same and we still have to follow our constitutive law we still have to say that stress equals young's modulus times the strain what that means is that you can kind of make some cancellations on here to figure out what things have to be equal. 
Um, so for, exa for example, sigma 2, 3 and sigma 3, 2, and this is where it starts to get wild, actually have to be equivalent. So sigma 3, 2 and sigma 2, 3 have to be equal. Um, the reason being is you have to conserve angular momentum. So let me let me draw this. I'm going to draw this in this plane. So looking at it in this direction, right? Put a put an eyeball there. So let's let's just redraw it in this direction. I'll, I'll draw it with straight lines. So we've got here. Um, we've got direction three. Here we've got direction two. Now I'll draw my little cube. Um, let me at least try and make it look square. Got my little cube here. There. Okay. So I let's say I calculated that there's some stress, some there's some shear stress here, and I'm going to draw the shear stress with one. Uh, just with one arrow to indicate that it's a shear stress. Right now, we'll pretend there are no normal stresses. It's just just our our bolt example from earlier, right? If if I were to do statics on this, I have a huge problem. I would say, well, I mean, if it's got a center of mass here, there's a, there's some distance, even though it's really small. There's still some distance. Like this thing should start spinning. So there must be some other stress acting in a different acting opposite to it so we say okay yeah sure maybe there's some some other shear stress acting opposite so now we've at least satisfied uh the sum of the forces so we've said okay the sum of the forces in direction three is zero okay at least statics works out there for us but now as you can see well we've got one force kind of rotating it that way another force kind of rotating it that way Oh shit! Our our little our little block is now gonna start rotating. So um, I've got to say, well, there's got to be some other something else acting to avoid that. So I'll I'll draw another thing and I'll say, okay, let's just say this is. I said this is a square. So this this direction this dimension's the same, and this uh, this the magnitude of this stress because remember. Stresses at the core are forces. We just say they're applied over an area. So because these are all the same side lengths, these are thought of as forces. So I've got some stress acting now in this plane. So this would be this would be stress two three. This one would be stress three two. This one is minus stress two three. Um, and then if I, I'm going to draw another one on here is minus stress three, two. Um, so now, now I can see, okay, um, now that I've got uh, another stress here, I have to balance it, which is why the, the reason that I drew this one at the bottom was to balance it in direction two. So now I have the sum of the forces in direction two is zero and the sum of the moments is zero. because so I've got these two that are kind of acting to rotate it clockwise, and then these two that are kind of act forcing it to rotate counterclockwise. Um, so in order for this, in order for our little differential, our, our little teeny tiny block of material to behave according to the laws of physics, according to um, according to Newton's first three laws, right? We have to have a shear on all four surfaces in order for this to be in equilibrium. Um, the, so this minus sigma two, three and minus sigma three, two, we usually don't draw them. Uh, we usually don't talk about them because it's implied. It's understood that they exist. Um, it's understood that they're there, but it's, uh, since we know that they're equal magnitude, we, we don't care about them necessarily. Um, Another interpretation of this, another another reason that you might see these, like one acting in one direction, one acting in the other direction. Another reason that you would see that happen, right? If I if I go back here, um, if I take a, 
one section here. Um, let's say this is that section. All right, I'm going to cut off. I'm going to remove this part here. I'm going to remove this part here. So if there is, if there's a force, we've got a force acting here, then from, from earlier when we said we had our, our free body diagrams, our cut free body diagrams, I would expect a shear acting in that direction. Because the reaction here has to be equal and opposite, I would expect a shear acting here, right? Equal in magnitude to the one on this side of the cut plane. So we'll put a, a cut plane in there. I would expect this one to be equal and opposite to that one. If we, may, if we put in that second cut plane, well, we would expect there to be an equal and opposite shear on here too. But we take this, this middle free body diagram, we do statics, we do our statics on it, we say, okay, there has to be a shear here, which means there has to be a shear acting in this direction on the other one. Now, as we move these two planes closer and closer together, we move them so close together that we get this distance. We eventually get our plane so close that they're at this differential distance d. They're as close together as we can possibly think of them before we really just say they're in the same place. And you can see from this example, well, they have to be pointing in opposite directions. And the the direction, like which side of the of your cut plane you choose to analyze is arbitrary, right? It's something that we've chosen. We've decided I'm interested in looking at it from this perspective because it makes it easier for me to think about. So that's why we usually just talk about the positive side on here. We just say, I care about stress 2, 3. I care, I made my cut plane here. I made my cut plane in direction 2, and I'm seeing it in direction 3. I don't want to think about it being negative. That's really complicated. That's, that's more than I care about. So we usually just don't talk about this side. But um, we still want to think about stress in the other direction, which is why it's represented in our stress tensor, because we could make this cut in any plane. So we still need some way of describing it in the other plane. Um, but while we're describing it in this other plane, um, it's, it's all about sort of where we pictured it from. So I can do my math a little easier since I know because, due to angular momentum these two stresses have to be the same. Um, when, I, when I broke it down to as smallest as it could be, I now only have to worry about six of the nine entries in the stress tensor because this one here, um, what's a good contrasting color there? This one here and this one here are equivalent. So at the end of the day, I really, I just have, I just have three normal stresses. I have, I have sigma one one, sigma two two, sigma three three, and three shear stresses, tau one two, tau one three, and tau two three or sigma one two, sigma one three, sigma two three. These are are the six things that I need to talk about to describe what's going on. Um, again, we like to use this stress tensor. We like to to put those in there because they do exist. They are fundamentally there. Like there is, if we have a shear in this direction, there does have to be a shear acting in this other plane for them to act for like for them to be real for them to be something that the material is experiencing but we often don't have to we don't have to necessarily um we don't have to specifically solve for them um we don't have to individually in every plane make a cut and solve for everything because we already have enough equations to describe that um if you remember back to when we were talking about 3D, st 3D statics, so statics in three dimensions, 
we said we have the sum of the forces in all three dimensions. So I'll call that the vectors on the forces and the sum of the moments in all three directions. And this is it. Like this is still just six equations. So this means we can only solve six unknowns with our six equations. And conveniently, this model, this model that we have has six unknowns. It has these, these primary six things that we don't know. And these other unknowns are something that we can solve for. So ultimately, where that leads us is it allows us to talk about stresses and strains as one big old vector, one big giant vector here. Um, you can see that the uh, we've now chosen to represent this as just just a, a list, just a vector of three or of six different six different types of stress. So these three are our normal stresses. These three are our shear stresses. So again, I could write this as tau xy, tau yz, and tau xz. And then I just I can just plug each of those values in into this um, into this stress tensor where it fits. So I plug that one in there, and I know that these are all equivalent. So I, I can also come off of here and plug it in there. Um, Another good way to think about this is a stress is something that acts in a combination of directions. So in, in one plane, right, we have to have one direction that is normal to the plane and one direction that's in the plane. And if you were to talk about that stress, your directions are the same. It's just the plane that we're looking at, it changes. So let's say, Let's say I have some stress, some stress tau. Oh, that was a J, not a tau. Some stress, oh, come on, tau that I've, I've said happens in this plane. All I have to do is just change my perspective. I change the plane, but tau still acts in a combination of those dimensions, right? This, this tau let's say this is direction two, direction three, direction two, direction three, right? This one I would call tau two, three, and this one I would call tau three, two. Remember, the, the actual stress itself is still the same. It's just the, the plane that we're looking at it in changes. And we can carry these over in our in our stress tensor in this matrix here and we just say they're the same thing so with the linear iso linear ice ah, with the isotropic linear elastic model oh boy we now have a way of describing all three of our normal stresses all three of our shear stresses which gives us some way of describing all of our strains um, this big matrix here um, you'll notice it kind of has two sections. It has two, two sections here. Um, this tells us our strains in some different directions. Um, so these are our normal strains. And yes, there is such a thing as shear strain. Um, usually shear strain isn't something that we actually talk about because it's not something we can, it's not something we can fundamentally measure, right? I can't see, I can't look into, uh, I can't look into a body and see planes moving within themselves. It's just, it's not a concept that makes sense. But when talking, uh, when using this model, when you talking about things elastically, I can see those resolve themselves into three different, into these three strains that I can measure. So these are just strains in the three cardinal directions. This would be how much it changes shape in the x direction, how much in the y direction, how much in the z direction. Um, and when we're describing, when we're using this big, um, this big equation here, um, 
this is just sort of a, a simple way of, of collecting all of our variables and summing them up. Um, I know we're starting to get low on time here, uh, but we started a little late, so I'm just going to add one more slide. Um, so let's just take, uh, let's just take, um, I want to cover two more points. Um, are you guys okay with that? This shouldn't take too long. Fine with me. Ernesto, you good with that? Yeah. Okay. We're almost done, I swear. So let's just take one value here. Um, just, just to kind of explain what this whole matrix is. Um, I, I know it's a lot to look at, but if we break it down, it should, it should make a lot of sense. So let's talk about the, let's talk about the strain in the, purely in the X direction. So this is in our, um, in our axial model, what we were calculating. We basically said there are no effects, there are no stresses. We said none of these other stresses existed. Um, we only saw a stress in the x-x direction. So if we break this out, if we actually do the matrix math here, uh, yeah, if we do the matrix math here, we see that sigma x-x, which is just, all that is, is the strain in the x-direction, sigma x-x equals, um, it should be 1 over e, 1 over e, plus uh, negative, uh, not rho, nu over e, so minus nu, oh, sorry, that's not nu, that's actually a v over e. Oh, I missed, I missed a, a thing. This is matrix math here. So, matrix math. So we've got 1 over e times sigma xx times sigma xx plus or sorry minus v over e minus v over e times sigma yy minus v over e times sigma zz minus v over e times sigma zz um this, at least this part of the equation should look familiar. If we reorder it a bit, you see E times sigma xx equals, or sorry, E times epsilon xx equals sigma xx. So this is just the, if I, if I erase the, the directions on here, right? This is just our definition of stress. So that part makes sense, right? We've got a stress in a direction, um, or we've got a stress in a direction divided by Young's modulus. It's a strain in, in, in a direction. Then the next part here is actually the same thing, but we're taking into account now the, um, the transverse strain. So this is, this is when we were talking about Poisson's ratio. Poisson's ratio, right? So we said... Let's say we set we said sigma e equals e times stress, and we said e transverse equals sigma times v. Well, e transverse means e in a direction perpendicular to the to to whatever the the other one we're talking about. So x x is a direction that's perpendicular to y. So if we kind of, if I put some, put some subscripts on here now, put y, 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 and then if I call this y, y here, now e transverse, or sorry, epsilon transverse is epsilon x, x, and I usually say this is negative because remember if we're, um, if we're talking about transverse stress, we're usually talking about something shrinking, right? If I, I pull these two apart, if we see necking, this is going to shrink. Um, so if I rearrange some variables here, I get sigma, uh, that should be sigma, or not, 
not sigma, we should get epsilon xx equals minus v over e times sigma yy here. And now, as part of this, this long vector equation, we're just simply adding the amount of transverse stress that we expect to see onto our model. Now, for our simple example earlier, you know, this was zero and that was zero, so it didn't matter. We didn't have to worry about it. But if we had some more complicated loading scenario, we would we would see potentially some some effects from that that transverse behavior um, that we just add on to our main behavior. And that gives us our big ol' equation for strain in the x direction. So that's the first point. Second point, um, and this is something um, I'll, it'll it'll come a bit later after we talk about some more statics topics. Um, but these we usually end up canceling out. So we usually will call these zero zero zero. The way we do that is with something called a stress rotation or a um, a principal axis rotation. Basically, we just we change. So after we solve after we solve this whole thing, we then rotate our axes. So we would we would rotate these to be some di some direction where something that we were calling a shear stress before is now a normal stress, and something that we were calling a normal stress before, or some sorry something that we were calling a shear stress before combines with a normal stress so i mean this these are still vectors we do some vector math we add this one we add this one with that one um so then we just describe it in terms of they're called principal stresses um and this 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 topic deserves a lot more attention when and we'll get to it um later on in the in a, a, another video but we usually don't care about um about these transverse strains or these uh, these strains that are in plane um, because once we once we actually get down to it after we solve everything then we we rotate our field of view so that we're only talking about strains in directions that we can actually measure um, and this is a really important thing to do in real life when you're doing when you're measuring stuff with strain gauges um, or when you're, if you displace something and measure it, you always want to measure in a direction that makes sense. You measure if we have, you know, if we had that bolt, we take that bolt again, we're going to measure it in this direction and in that direction. We're not going to measure it something like here. Like that, that's just, that makes everyone's life, life harder. Um, and uh, when, once we resolve sort of our, once we resolve the scenario, once we figure out the directions that everything's acting in, um, then we can say, okay, this is how we expect it to behave. So, in recap, um, talking about the linear iso the isotropic linear elastic model. Um, this is based on a combination of constitutive theory, so this idea that that materials that we can analyze, um, common materials like steels, plastics, even wood to some extent, will act um, will act just like a spring. They're all made up of the same stuff, and they react the same in every direction. We're assuming that these are um, that these are bodies that behave according to Newtonian physics, according to classical physics. And then we've made some assumptions that will make our calculations easier and that make our lives easier so we can really talk about and really analyze um, engineering problems effectively in a relatively small amount of time. So um, that concludes our discussion on the isotropic linear elastic model. And... That concludes the stress and strain topic of our engineering basics.